Welcome to the Social Media Cafe podcast. I'm Bridie Castiel, social media strategist for small business owners. So grab a coffee and join us for a chat about social media marketing and running a small business. Hi, Bela. I am so happy you're like one of the first people to do this podcast with me because I feel like your journey in launching the business in the last year and like how you've managed to use social media has been super inspiring for so many people. So I'm really, really excited to have you and hear like what that experience was like for you. But first, I would love it if you could tell everybody a little bit about yourself and your business. So I am Bela Haskell and I have started a vegan empire, as I like to <laughs> look at it one day, um, called Veg It Out. Um, I'm really, really passionate about um, first, really good food that makes you feel good. Um, and then secondly, um, things that are, do good for you. So mm. all natural, not processed, little like processed sugar as possible. Um, and, you know, all, there's always this connotation of like vegan and gluten-free and whatever. And then the food can taste like crap, but that's really not the case. And definitely today there's more and more vegan brands coming out with awesome food. Um, so basically that's what Veg It Out is around. Um, we'll probably go more into like the target audience and things like that later. Um, but I think my differentiator as opposed to a lot of the other vegan brands that are out is that I'm a religious Jew and I don't think there's a lot of... Um, vegan influencers in that space that are in the religious Jewish space. So I think that's mm -hmm. something that many people are excited about to, you know, connect to and get into. So, yeah. I love that. One of the things that I really love about your brand, and I've been following you and eating your food for some time at this point, um, is that although like all of your, um, all of your bowls, all of your recipes and all of what will be is like, is vegan, right? But like, when I think of budget out, I don't think about veganism and all of the connotations that come with that good and bad, right? There's, there's a lot of yes. that, but I, 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 and I don't think of like healthy brown food, which there's been plenty of that too. I just think of like more delicious vegetables. Like I think of like and I love the way that you used plant-based instead of like vegan and a lot of the, um, like your bio and stuff. I don't know if it's still that way now, but you know, you were so like focused on the vegetables as a thing for any person, right? Yeah. This is not for vegans who want to eat vegan. And I think that's what, what's really cool about like the kosher aspect is like, this is food for any person, even people who eat meat, eat dairy, but keep kosher, like, you know, you just kind of have that like whole intersection. And I love that because I think there's so much pressure around veganism um, yeah. that puts a lot of people off. I, well, I would prefer to use the term plant-based because I think that's much more aligned with my values. Mm -hmm. um, I do believe in veganism and whatever we can talk about that. But um, I think I started using vegan, like now even presenting it because many people don't know the term plant-based or that's my assumption. Um, so I say vegan, but I'm like, but it's healthy vegan. Cause you could be vegan and eat, you know, Oreos all day and, you know, beyond burgers and whatever, which is fine. Like, you know, all, you know, everything to you, but like, that's not necessarily healthy. Um, and yeah, exactly right. So like, if you go to my website, it says, you know, eat more veggies. And I had this line also like making veggie sexy again. Um, because in the end of the day, I think in, you know, in the Western diet, we've um, become very dependent on animal protein. And I don't know, I don't know if people like how people who are not vegan hear that term, like, but I call it animal protein because there's vegetable protein, there's animal protein. We, so we become very reliant. And like throughout history, we've eaten animals and we've eaten animal byproducts and things like that. Um, but it wasn't readily available. It was a luxury, mm -hmm. like maybe kings and queens um would would eat those things and and the diseases that wealthy people had were like cancer and heart disease and diabetes those are all things that were called like um rich diseases and and many of the diseases now with you know vaccines and whatever it is like we've sort of gotten rid of them and then these these wealthy diseases have now sort of trickled out into the rest of the population and i think i i strongly believe that there it's not um like it's not the worst thing in the world to eat animal protein. 
I think that just what ends up happening is when we have the money and we have um, the ability to eat meat and dairy and fish and it tastes really good. Like I haven't eaten red meat, I think now in five or six years, I love lamb chops. Like seriously, I haven't had it in years, but like loved, loved, loved. Um, but, but we eat so much of it and it's so like, it's cheap. It's, you know, fairly cheap. Um, so really what I was trying to do with my brand is so like, we can have like, I say, you know, making vegetables sexy again, because it's like vegetables can be really good. Like what you were saying, like they could not just be really good. They could be tasty and yummy and filling and gourmet. Um, and you don't need a piece of steak next to it. So yeah. That's right. It's a really, whole meal. That's what I loved about, about your bowls. Is like, it really is a whole meal. Like you do feel like you ate a whole meal when you, when you ate it and there's literally nothing in there that isn't plant-based um, or grain-based, you know, in, in accompaniment. And like, I mean, I grew up in, in England, right? I grew up in probably pretty typical medical, middle class, um, mostly not Jewish community. Um, and the staple of a British diet is meat and two veg, but two veg, <laughs> one of those potato. is potato. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that's meat and one veg. What are you left with? Some kind of boiled carrot, some kind of boiled broccoli, some kind of boiled cauliflower. So basically like anything where you've completely destroyed the texture, the taste and all of the nutrients out of the vegetable. So like, and, and, and like, as time has gone on, the vegetable really became less of a thing. So although in England, like there's these huge campaigns and that has been since I was growing up of eating five fruits and veg a day, people started to like put lots of fruit into their kids' diets. Yeah. But still didn't really add much in the way of vegetables to dinner time, right? So when I um, experienced like whole new cuisine and, and different flavors and stuff, marrying into a Moroccan family, um, you know, I, I, experienced vegetables in a in a whole different way that I never really considered before and then you for me took that one step further because I realized post having my son that I was not eating um in a in a way that was really giving me energy and making me feel good and I just didn't know how to put vegetables together in a way that actually tastes good and then I would eat your bowls and I'm like that was like better than anything I've had in weeks I started getting really passionate about all of this stuff, like um, eating less processed, cutting out sugars, to, you know, to a certain extent. Um, and after my father got sick with cancer, um, now it's uh, five years ago, um, because, you know, when you start Googling, like something happens, I think most of us, and then we start going down this like rabbit hole and searching whatever. And then Google realizes like, Hey, you're into cancer stuff. So we're going to just pop up everything about it. So there was this pop-up that was talking about how the um, cure for cancer industry is like a trillion dollar industry, but the cancer prevention industry is like almost non-existent. Now, I think, you know, five years later, I think many more people are talking about it and it is something people are aware of, but I guess five years ago, it, was, it wasn't. I didn't even know about this. Um, and they were talking about, again, like the Western diet, the Western diet of processed foods, of, you know, fast foods, of heavy animal protein. Um, my father had leukemia. So leukemia, or it's called AML, um, but it's a type of leukemia and, and they don't really know what causes it. His father, when he was in his 20s, also passed away from a blood cancer, um, multiple myeloma, which is also like a type of leukemia or similar to leukemia. And um, there's no like cause. It's not like, oh, you, you know, smoked. So therefore this, you did this. Like, right. I mean, so, so it's not like, oh, we ate Western diet. Therefore they got cancer. However, there's always this school of thought that like for many, for many years that everything is genetic. Like, oh, this parent got this. There's no, um, there's no link between the cancer that my grandfather had versus the, the cancer that my father had. And what more and more studies are coming out with is that it's not just our genetics, it's also our environment. And it's also what we're exposing our bodies to. So we all might have like um, the ability to develop certain diseases and certain things, like but a predisposition to predisposition. That's exactly where the word I wanted to use. Like we could have a predisposition to a certain thing. 
Um, but we can never develop it if we do certain things. And there are people that could live. I always hear this story because when I t tell this story, people are like, well, I had a neighbor and she was, you know, ran marathons and she was super healthy. And then she, you know, died of whatever cancer. Right. And of course, of course. But anyway, um, so I started going down this path and reading a lot. Um, and I realized like, I don't have control, but this is something that I can have control of. Um, we also have um, colon cancer is a big thing in our family. So, and I've, I've had to get, um, you know, checks every few years. Um, and, and for me, like cutting out meat is something that will make a difference. So I started looking into all of these things. Um, and while I was in high tech and starting to cook this way, I in high tech, you know, at two kids and then three kids, um, and, and cooking this way, you know, cutting out, we used to buy like, you know, jars of pesto and ketchup and mayonnaise and great stuff. And it's awesome. Um, but I started realizing like, Hey, I want to, I want to start making some things on my own. So I started making my own pesto and we started, we stopped buying ketchup altogether. Um, we stopped buying mayonnaise and I sort of took on this perspective of like, if I want sugar in my food, I'm going to add it myself. I want to know what it is. I want to see it. I want to do it. Um, but again, it takes time. And I was a workaholic in high tech in Intel and then another like drone company. Um, and there's no time. And it just, that was my only hobby was this cooking. So I'd have people over and we'd make awesome things. Like I'd make really fun things and different things, whatever. And people were like, wow, this is so good. Like I had a few friends that were like, you should open a catering business. And I was like, eh, whatever. You know, I think so many people hear that in their life. You should, wow, you should turn that hobby bag business into a business. Like you should turn that whatever hobby into a thing. And most people are like, what? And then, um, I was at the startup and it was, it was very cool. Like I said, it worked with drones and it was computer vision, machine learning. I'm going to use buzzwords, AI, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and very, very cool stuff. Um, the environment wasn't so emotionally healthy uh, mm -hmm. for me. Um, and I sort of felt like I, I had to leave. Um, and so I basically came to my husband at the point, like it took me two and a half years to decide to leave. And I came to my husband and I'm like, okay, I need to quit. I'm going to go to culinary school and I'm going to go work on a farm. And um, I have a bunch of other ideas that I'm going to work on, um, but I need to like start learning new stuff. I don't know what I'm doing yet, but I want to do something with like sustainability and food and something. And he was like, okay. Like also mind you, I was the main breadwinner. Like he's a, he's a physical therapist, my husband, and he's amazing. And he has a private practice, but um, high tech versus any small business. It's, it's yeah. not even comparable. And now that I'm out of it, I realize like it's, it's, it's crazy. Um, if you love working in startup, you should stay, stay there. Don't, <laughs> no, it's like, if you're doing it for the money, that's where the money's at. Don't but, um, open a small business if you think it's for the money. money. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, eventually. Or for shorter eventually. hours. If you think you're going to put in less hours on your own business right. than working in right. high tech. Uh -uh, right. you're wrong or sleep better or sleep better at night time no. no uh so so my husband was like um okay so how about you put together a plan of like what you're gonna do and how long it's gonna take and then like let's talk again and then and then we'll like take steps and then I was like uh, okay. Like I was like, I'm like, cause when we had that meeting, I was like crying. I was like, I'm leaving my job. This is what I'm going to do. And he was like, okay, let's put together a plan. So I came back a week later and I was like, I'm going to do something with food and vegan food. And I know people like it and I'm not sure yet, but within six months, I will be bringing in X amounts of money. And here's my like nice, you know, Excel chart and blah, blah. Obviously that was total BS, but it made him feel better. And I felt like <laughs> better to go in. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I literally just started posting like how I started. And I basically just, I didn't know what I was going to build. I had no clue. Um, I just started putting, re posting recipes. I had, um, and my sister got married two years before that. And I made her this cookbook in, in, you know, Google Docs, like super not professional, super low tech. Um, and, you know, I just wanted to put something together that'd be the least effort possible. And I had pictures on my phone of food that I made. So I took those pictures and I wrote down recipes. It was supposed to be like a family effort. Like I was going to get recipes from all the family and no one gave me. So it was all my recipes. Um, so basically when I started posting, I was like, okay, I have all these recipes written up. I'm going to start posting them. And 
I'm sure anyone who's starting out on social media sees that when you start posting on your personal page, maybe you'll have some relatives and people are like, oh, cool, what's that, what's that? But you're not getting a large audience. And I, I think I learned this from Sivan Felder from Two Heads, I'm not sure, but I basically started um, joining every vegan Facebook group like that exists on Facebook um, and sort of posting my recipes um and and like people really liked them like people really thought you know thought they were really good and interesting um and i started um making phone calls to different people like gathering friends and family and asking them like i had a you know a a um a form and of like questions that i needed answered to try to understand like what are people's problems i was a product mm -hmm. manager in startup mm -hmm. And okay, so you were doing some market research. Market research, exactly. Like when we're we're doing when in 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 products and UX, like you always do, like you try to find out like what's it's the same thing when you're doing market research. It's like what's the customer's biggest problem? Mm -hmm. What are they looking for? What are they using already? And when I called people, I got all these different answers. Like you know, um, I'm ex you know why aren't you eating healthier or why aren't you cooking more or whatever it is? And it's like I'm exhausted. I don't have time again and again. And then it was like, then I started realizing people were talking about ordering out a lot. So I was like, how many times a week do you order out? How much money do you order out? And I, I think I probably spoke to over a hundred people, Israelis and English speakers in Israel. And, and that kept coming back again and again. And, and there was a moment where it was like, people are exhausted or they don't have time. That's the same thing. And they're ordering out like they want food. Like I sort of put that together. Um, and realized, okay, like that's probably a place to start. Um, but it took me a while. I, I, I kept posting, like I kept posting on Facebook and then Facebook groups, again, getting reactions. People liked my food and then Instagram, I started doing it. And again, little reactions, little comments, people, people reaching out to me. It took me till last Pesach. I was doing, I was posting and just figuring out things for like nine months, literally. Like I, I was on Naftala but it's not like that doesn't, right. you know, it helps, but, um, and, and then the pandemic happened and I didn't have a product to sell. And I reached out to two heads, actually, Sivan Felder is one of my best friends. And, um, and so her brother who runs it with her, Barak Shachnavitz, I reached out to him because he was like always my, like my unofficial business advisor. And like, he was someone I could talk to. And I was like, okay, I, what, what am I doing? Like the pandemic happened. I need to keep this going. I need to start selling something like, what should I do? And we were talking and somehow I, I came up with the idea to do a cookbook for Pesach. And it was like three weeks before Pesach. Like this was probably a really bad idea, but anyway. Um, so I basically, I, I came up with a bunch of recipes for Pesach that were um, vegan. You can't use any lentils cause it's, so it's kidney oat free. Um, which makes it much more complicated. And then I didn't want to use any like gabrux, even though we're not gabrux, mm -hmm. but I didn't want to use like, I don't know, matzah meal or whatever, because I right. just keep it gluten-free. So gluten-free, um, uh, kidney oat free, vegan, like wow. challenge, go. Okay, so I in came up with all these, in three weeks. Maybe it was four weeks, I'll look, because maybe this wasn't that impressive, but four weeks still, I think <laughs> it's a big deal. Um, and I, I had to make everything. I wanted to take pictures of everything myself. So I took pictures of everything and, you know, cause two heads is very big on video. Barack's like, you need to do videos to promote this. Cause up until then I wasn't doing videos. Everything was, um, pictures with recipes. I had a blog, whatever. And I was like, but, but my camera is not good quality and I've never done a video before and I don't know how to edit and. And he's like, not only need to do videos, like you can't do those like tasty videos with your hands. You have to, like people need to see your face. Like I know food videos are with thing, but like you see the difference when people see your face, you have to do it with your face. You're like, but I, I don't know what if, I, I don't know what if, well, I don't look like the other people that are in the videos or whatever. So I started, I put out, you know, I posted this, um, this cookbook. I was charging $20 for this. It was like a PDF, but I was like, I don't know. That's let's just put the price there. And I started doing these videos and putting it out and people really liked them and people really related to them. And I started realizing like people were sending me messages on Instagram and like, oh my gosh, like 
I just became vegan and I can't find recipes for Pesach or like I haven't found kosher recipes or like it's so cool that you were doing this and I haven't seen other religious people and I started realizing like oh my target market isn't vegans it's Jews maybe religious Jews but like Jews that want to be eating more plant-based maybe are vegan and or relate to vegan ideology like I wasn't still sure yet and that sort of took me towards that like very niche it's very very niche um I thought and and yeah and I I sold I think I sold like 20 or 30 of those cookbooks um from those videos it was from putting out those videos I think I did three or four and it was like and I realized like wow okay that that's a big deal like that makes a big difference social media the video tends to come with that biggest barrier because there's so many uh vulnerable weak spots right that you can you can be got for yeah and it's and it's you know it's um it's really putting yourself out there and it really kind of challenges you in ways that you may not be comfortable with um you know for example you could get a graphic designer to go off and make you a whole bunch of graphics and you could say you did it yourself on video you gotta like it's your face like you gotta be the one like there's no replacing you there's no getting a better professional maybe you can get someone to film and to edit and do all those things but at the end of the day like it's your face on the front of it. And the, the thing about social media, especially in the last couple of years, and this is where Two Heads really jumped in with this message at the right time, um, uh, like 18 months ago, two years ago almost, is that social media content, like the, the key to succeeding on social media is consistency. Yeah. And no small business owner can afford or have the time to create high quality content consistently. So you can right. you can focus on creating quality content in terms of the message, in terms of the, the what you actually, the value you give, but all the fluffy stuff around it, like nobody got time for that and it will never pay off. It will never pay off if you're spending thousands and thousands of shekels at the beginning of your business on having someone help you film. Like it just is not, it just doesn't pay because you need something new every week at least. Um, right. you know, that's a huge expense. So yeah, no, it's absolutely right. I wouldn't have gotten started even like if they didn't push me, I think even the pictures in the beginning, the reason why I did the pictures in the beginning is that was easier than doing video. And I knew right. I had to start doing video, but, um, absolutely. And that's when sort of TikTok came in. Cause as I was actually filming, um, the videos last Pesach, so it's already like a year, like, um, I, I, I remember talking to Barack and I'm like, should I film them? um landscape or portrait because I see these like videos coming out now from this like at TikTok I didn't even know what it was and like a lot of people are doing that like maybe I should start st- like putting my stuff there and again not to his thing no one knew mm-hmm. um that it was going to be this big thing but he's like focus and this is the right advice for sure focus on one platform and then grow but but I did have a feeling and and it's funny because like so then later on in that year, I, um, I started playing off TikTok because everyone did. And when you, when you open that app for the first time, I don't know if it's still the same way, but it's like, like teenage Israeli girls in their room. That's like not, thank God I make food. I don't even have to try to do the dances. I see you. You're really good. Like you're, you have to and you have to like thing I did like once or twice and I'm like I'm just gonna I'm gonna stick to food for right now um, this is this is a huge misconception this is something I love to talk about because even now right and and I really only jumped on TikTok at the beginning of the corona pandemic um and I think TikTok saw enormous growth um this time last year just because of that and enormous waves of different demographics completely out of the box to what TikTok had before. So TikTok used to be musically and it used to be for like, seriously, like preteens um, doing their little sing-alongs and that kind of thing. So that's where it like started. And, and then like Corona hit and the content just blew up. And like this chick with her rabbi dad is on it. And like, yeah, I, I, and I, like love, I love to talk about it. Anyone who's not on TikTok, like I, who am I talking to? Because it's like my husband here. Like, who am I talking to? Like, I keep trying to tell him this. I can tell you now because this is awesome. <laughs> videos on. Like, TikTok did something that's so amazing in terms of like, 
YouTube democratized TV video production for sure, but you still, to do really well, you still need to have a level. What TikTok, like I'm super fascinated by it. Like I'm, I'm, I'm an addict at heart. So like TikTok's really dangerous for me, but like, um, especially screen addict, like nothing else, screen addict, <laughs> yeah. I'm a screen addict. It is um, the most addictive platform. I have to say sure. that like, I love TikTok at the end of the day. It's the place I go where I'm like, cause I work in social media, right? So for me, Instagram is work, Facebook is work, LinkedIn is work, Pinterest is work. <laughs> like it's all work. TikTok is like, so addictive and so entertaining like if you if you all came to like listen to me and like peek into my bedroom at night like there's nothing naughty happening it's me going ah this is amazing and like my husband thinks yeah, I'm cracked because it, like do you try to show him the things yeah I tried to make him watch things he's like what, what the what are you watching you are you've cracked you've you've he's gone dead. he's pretending with his kid do you do you follow the dad one there's like daddy mm. like He's like a dad and he has his, he pretends to use his kids. Oh my God. Okay, I have to say it's so funny. But anyway, like what I find fascinating at TikTok from a business, because when I watch it, it is all business. I'm like, oh, okay, I have to say this one. I have to do that kind of video. Mm -hmm. um, but what I find so fascinating is like, it does not matter the quality. It's like the worst quality ever. Like that's even like Dufka and they're focusing in on their face. And like, there's that girl with the hands. I saw you post yeah, it. I, I love, love that. that. I that that's so, she's so funny. And it's like the biggest, like, it's like the anti-quality. I think it's like almost like the anti-Christ of social media, right? Yeah. And, but there's so much to be learned there. Like once you get on and you get past that, those little like creepy Israeli girls like dancing in their bra and underwear, then you get to this point where it's like, there's so much education. Like I follow parenting um, people. I yep. follow social media people. I follow cooking people. And that's sort of before I got onto TikTok, I actually, I went on and I was like, I'm not getting any cooking stuff in my feed, but I'm sure there are cooking videos out here. Like this was probably seven months ago or maybe more than that. And, and I started typing like vegan cooking or cooking and then started seeing the style. And like, you really had these things where like people would just come up in front of the thing. I'm just standing up now, but it's like, they were like, okay, today we're making, <laughs> da, da, da. and then, and then they let's would go. Just, yeah, let's go, let's do it. And then, and I was like, okay, I'm just going to do it. So, so what happened with me, how I realized TikTok, I think I did like one or two, nothing. I made like my first video was like, I did a watermelon, like watermelon sugar. That was like the, mm -hmm. you know, watermelon sugar. Right. Um, so I did like one with cutting it in a cool way, whatever. And then I, it was a combination of TikTok and then also coming up with a cool concept. I dreamed about this thing. I love sushi, like love sushi. And I've rolled my own sushi at home or whatever, but it's always such a pain. And it's mm -hmm. always like, everyone eats it while you're making it. And by the time, the same thing with like pancakes and whatever. I was like, just gonna the, say pancakes. Yeah, That's I the hate, pancake effect. I hate pancakes because by the time <laughs> they sit down, there's no more pancakes. It's like, I just did all this effort yeah. and I don't even get pancakes. So sushi is the same thing. And you try to cut it, the whole thing falls apart. Like it sucks. And I, I literally don't know how I like, it came to me in a dream. It's like totally like God. From above. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, what if you could put sushi in a pan sheet and put all the filling inside and then cover it up and then you just have, would that work? Like, would that even work? And I Googled it. Cause anytime I have good ideas, usually someone did it already. Like it's usually out there. Like you can, so I think for everyone in everyone's business, yeah. like, oh my God, that is brilliant. And so no one did it before wow and I was like, no spending like 300 400 shekel on sushi if we order and we have like three small kids like it's not okay like i don't want to spend that much money on takeout right um, so so i was like i i like literally just like i was like okay i'm gonna do it um and i sometimes make this mistake of like i make a recipe the first time and i'm like i'm gonna film it while i'm doing it because it's gonna come out good anyway so and and here like i wasn't sure and i and i did it I like first, first I filmed it. I, did, I just put my phone on, I, we have a shelf like over my counter and I've done that a lot. I like, we'll stick my phone and I just did it in like, like um, time-lapse and film myself making it. Mm -hmm. And then I cut it and afterwards I'm like, oh my God, this is so amazing. And I got on, I like not wearing almost any makeup. I'm like wearing this <laughs> hat and like, I don't look good there in that video at all. And I like just get, I'm like, oh my God, I just made 
49. <laughs> like, I don't know, have you seen the video? Yeah, like a hundred times. I like, but it wasn't, yeah. I watched, I watched myself a hundred times because I remember like trying to redo it after I was able to come up with that. But it was like, it wasn't even because I was like copying those people from like, I was so excited. It's like, oh my God, I made 49 sushi. You have to try this. And then, so then I show the thing. And then after I'm like eating it and whatever. And because I knew that was my formula anyway. And, and it blew up. I got like, it's like a hundred thousand views and like thousand, wow. like 10,000 likes and comments and people still like nine months later are still will, like post and make it or whatever. But after it happened, I remember I spoke to Esther Taub because she's like really big in the Instagram space, mm -hmm. like social media. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I have this success on this thing. This I posted, I come to her a lot with like social media questions also. And um, I'm like, what do I do? And she's like, you just got to write it. You, when you come out with something great, you have to come out with something great again. And like, it's great. And it's great advice, but I think it sort of freaked me out. I was like, how do you follow up Top something that's viral? How do you, like something goes viral and you didn't even realize. I didn't even prepare right. for it. Right. And well, usually people don't. <laughs> I know. That's, I know. that's a cool thing. There's a couple yeah. of things in that that I want to like pull out. Like one is the for fact sure. that on TikTok, um, the, the possibility of going viral on like the most random things, like the potential for getting literally thousands of views is huge. Like anything can blow up at any time is super unique in that way. Even with reels, like reels, um, which hasn't arrived in Israel yet, <laughs> but um, um, you know, with reels, like you can get thousands more views on your reels than you would on regular Instagram videos, but it's still not up there with TikTok. Like what the possibilities with TikTok and views is crazy. And there are people who have made like completely changed their lives, like regular people. Um, you know, I know, I know countless people, small business owners who are on TikTok and like one or two of their videos just like, just blows up and it's, and it's huge. But, um, I was just reading something, um, earlier or yesterday about viral content and this, this like, um, you know, we're always striving, like we always want to blow up. Like we think that like, you know, if we go viral once, like that's, that's it, we've made it, right? We're going to sell stuff and we're going to like make loads of money and we're going to have thousands and thousands of new followers. And, and the, the sad truth is that isn't true. And so, you know, what Esther was saying is that, you know, it sounds like what Esther was saying is that, you know, now that you've got new, um, new Why people you? paying attention yeah. to you, it's possible that if you follow that up with, good content consistently that you'll be able to grow and develop that audience because it just doesn't happen from that one viral post but that's a huge yeah. amount of pressure like you, you're right like how do you top that you don't so what you did that was really awesome is you kept posting it I saw that video and I watched it every single time <laughs> you posted it because why not um I saw that video I saw you post that video a lot of times in your stories <laughs> I don't know how many times you posted it on my on your feed but it came up a few like, times yes yeah yeah so like it just you know kept coming back and the really important thing about that is for things like your business like recipes somebody might see a video or see a recipe be like yeah that looks really good I'm going to come to that later and then they forget about you and they forget about the recipe and a sea of other recipes by reposting it you know people still appreciate they appreciate the reminder that this this recipe looks really good to them and that they maybe want to go and do it so like we always like all of us kind of get like, oh, we don't want to post it again. Like we don't want to repeat I, yeah, ourselves I, too I, much. I, da, 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 da. And yeah. and you are really, really good case in point that posting again and again and again, repurposing the content, bringing it up from the, from the grave time and time again. If you've got a good piece of content, rinse it. I realized though, now that we've been talking for a while, <laughs> we, were we were talking about your story, right? Um, and we were talking about the fact that you, you know, you were exploring the ideas of, you know, how to bring, you know, make vegetables sexy and bring plant-based food, kosher plant-based food to the community. We haven't actually talked about what you actually do. So please tell us about Veggie Owl a little bit before we go. Sure. So Veggie Owl um, provides ready-made meals um, that are delivered to people's doors every week. It's a subscription plan, um, which is pretty cool because that doesn't really exist yet in Israel. There are a lot of companies like that in America. Um, so you get these really yummy, tasty, if I do say so myself. Um, I think 
you know, aesthetically Thumbs beautiful <laughs> bowls um, delivered to your door. You get, you know, they're for the week. So there could be for dinner or for lunch or whatever it is. Um, and yeah. I can personally attest to the fact that they are in fact delicious. And I don't even have a microwave. So all of my bowls were consumed cold and they were still super delicious. Yeah. So, so there you go. The reason that I wanted you to say that is because uh, I believe everyone deserves veggie out bowls in their life. <laughs> so I just want everybody else to have the opportunity today, to, to... All of you free. Like, oh, like, I thought that's what you were saying. Take a free bowl. Take <laughs> a free bowl. Take a free bowl. <laughs> um, you know what? Maybe next year, currently, we do not have budget for that. Um, uh, so we'll, uh, you know, we'll come back around to that one. But yeah, that's, um, I, I think that it's super cool. I wanted to ask you a little bit about your experience with the subscription based business, right? Because as you put it, subscription based businesses don't exist too much in Israel. It's been a huge trend in America and in Europe, in the UK for a few years at this point, like everyone's used to the standard idea of paying some, for something and getting like a box of stationery, like it could be surprises. People don't even know what they're spending money on um, to some extent, right? In your case, obviously they do, they choose which ones they want each week and they, they get the choice out the menu. But have you found any like resistance to that model? Like what led you to choose that model? Like tell us about the experience. So it's so interesting. So I would say, I think I've sold, I think I just looked it on Wix yesterday. So like, let's say a hundred and... 20 subscriptions um, all together. So I have people that come back like um, every every week and some people that, you know, um, you know, jump off after a week or after a few weeks. Um, but so obviously there is that that's a lot to me. That number was like is when I realized I was like, wow, that's a lot. Um, and so obviously there are a lot of people. I think um, millennials get it like when they're ordering, like they really get it. And like, I don't have issues. It's sort of more of like, wait, how does it work? When can I cancel? And you know, mm -hmm. PayPal sucks. I'm really sorry. PayPal, by the way, in Israel is the only um, software that really supports subscriptions. Um, there's like Stripe, but you can't really use that in Israel, which makes it, which makes this business much more difficult. And I wonder if that's one of the reasons why there aren't as many in Israel. I'm not sure. Could um, well be. PayPal, PayPal, no offense, PayPal, but yes offense. like sucks i'm sorry you really suck um yep. and yep. yeah and what i am finding is um i'm not saying it's all older women generally women are my customers i have a bunch of guys that are buying directly from me but it's usually women um but the ones that have been having the difficulties were they're older and i'm not saying like old i'm saying like in their late 40s early 50s and they're like, wait, I don't get it. Like, why is this so complicated? Like I had one woman, I hope she doesn't watch your show, but she was like, I'm a computer engineer, like major, or I had a computer engineer major. And like, I don't understand how to use your website. It's super confusing. I don't understand. Like, why can't I just order up? She was on my blog and like, I kept sending her the right link. And I was like, this is, that's my blog. And this is the meal thing. And, and totally I can make things simpler, like for sure. But she didn't understand the concept. She's like, I want to order one pizza and one pan sheet sushi. <laughs> I was like, no, no, no. Um, so there was like, <laughs> it's a blog, there's recipes there, there's no place to order that. Um, but but I get that. Like, and it's like three people. Um, but generally people, they get it. And, and I do get people saying like, oh, I just want to order for one week. Or like, why can't I just order one bowl? I don't get it. And I like, as a small business owner, right? Like definitely in the beginning, we all, we want to like, sure okay you could have one bowl and like sure it could be one option and i've been very um what's the word like not strict but i've been very um disciplined and saying like to myself also like this is my business model and if i want to be able to grow this and expand it i have to try to do one thing and then eventually like this and this and this um so i tell people like look you can sign up for the subscription if you want to you know cancel after a week there's no problem just tell me by tuesday and that's fine um but I don't offer a one week thing. Like, and we only sell a minimum of three bowls. I know that's frustrating and I know you'd want to try one, but it only makes, it's only worth it. This business model is only makes sense if we're doing a minimum. So I have to Well, this is it. the thing with, with, with the food business, especially um, 
at the outset, like food is really reliant on scale and on numbers. Like when you have already, like you chopping two cabbages versus chopping up three cabbages or four cabbages in the food processor probably takes the same amount of time, right? Maybe a couple seconds more for every cabbage you add. Like, but the fact is you've already like sat down to chop up the first round of cabbage, right? And that's where, <laughs> that's where this idea of, we, we see this in like factories, it's as old as time, um, like batch processing uh, foods is, is the way to go. And so if you're like creating, like, you know, you're not a restaurant, you know, you're not like, and some and, people have a hard time understanding that. That's really right, hard. right. That's the that's the that's the switch. And also, like you're not you're also like you're not charging restaurant prices either. Like if if one bowl was available in a restaurant, I'm pretty sure it would be at least another third expensive, like a third more expensive, if not sure. double, um, than than what you're charging. You know, people have to take that into account. But I get how it's a complete mind shift because the subscription model just doesn't. Just doesn't exist it's a really interesting point where you say about the fact that the technology just isn't there to support it so whoever's listening and is in startup nation there are hundreds of thousands of small business owners who would happily build subscription-based businesses if you could build us the tech so get on that somebody please <laughs> it's, it's funny because like i'm from i'm from the startup and i'm from the <laughs> software world and i'm like you like should i be building software instead mm. the food business is really hard <laughs> So, um, and that is something like the food business is really, really hard. Um, I just got off the phone with someone just now before we got on. I was actually really excited that we got to speak about the social media aspect because like that I'm really passionate about and I'm really excited about. It. And I love the food. The, the production of food is really hard. Like there's a lot of details and a lot of things that go into it. Um, and yeah, it's. Well, it's, you're, you're cooking for a small army every week. So I can imagine that's pretty difficult. Yeah, we're, we're grown now. We're now due before, but like, I think by the, when you were ordering for me, I was doing everything out of my kitchen and it was about 70 meals a week. And now I, I like, I, I have a kitchen now, like I have a chef making Amazing. everything and everything. And it's, um, we're doing about 130, but I'm like keeping it small. Like, like, thank God we have a waiting list. And, you know, every few weeks I'm inviting more people on, but I don't want to grow too quickly because I want to make sure to keep the, you know, standards up. So that's amazing. That's amazing. It's been yeah. incredible to see you grow both on social media. Um, you've also shared your journey. You know, you've, you've been very transparent with, you know, numbers and people coming on board and the waitlist and stuff. And it's been really amazing and inspiring to see. So hopefully um, some people listening will, will have enjoyed getting to know you and your story a little bit more. And I think most of us can relate to starting a small business out of a need or a passion that came from some internal um, place, like internal need. You know, so many yeah. small businesses are born out of, of um, uh, an experience, be it a negative or a positive one. Um, and all I can say is that I'm I'm grateful that you you kind of have arrived where you are because it's super inspirational. So thank you so much for sharing your story and your time with me today. And uh, and I can't wait to see what the next year. I mean, you've already done so much in like less than a year. It's crazy. Yeah, but Bezlat Hashem will go back to normal working hours and like it'll just be business as usual. And I yeah, hope so. It's been a trying year. Definitely. Yeah, I hope so. You picked a good one to start a business. I have to say you are a particular type of brave or stupid or just a combination yeah, of the know. two. I don't I mean, know. <laughs> there's a fine line between. Yeah. Brave and yeah. stupid, right? What do they say? Yeah. There's a fine line between genius and insanity. Like that's pretty much what we're all bordering on these days where any of us are going after passion like you see any artists musicians actors whatever it is anyone that does really really well they're geniuses and insane because yeah because you have to be yeah i get it i get it all right well yofi thank you so much and uh zoom.